All right, and we are going to do part nine of Jan van Denberg's Crash Course on Stars. And in this part, we are looking at Antares. So to have the inspiration to give that bright light in the heart of Scorpio a name, Antares, a name that fits emerging out of a creative process in relation to that star. And seeing all this 17th century star devoted artwork, the way in which the star points were illustrated with wonderful creatures and stuff, making the Scorpio show up with Antares, this super giant. To know that neutrinos have mass, they aren't just names. And we have uh, the Etruscan god Ixion, it looks like, predates Christianity, often depicted on a solar wheel. The Aztec god Quetzalcoatl was born of a virgin, crucified and resurrected. Since 1991, it's proved in science that certain subatomic particles called neutrinos have mass. The revelation of human design is that what we are doing is filtering a data ocean, an ocean of consciousness. Awareness is what happens when you filter consciousness. We are self-aware. The byproduct of filtering the data stream is an illusion of our own particular consciousness. Mammals, plants, insects make different interpretations out of that data stream. No, image here. Neutrinos, the vital clue to a theory of everything, hunting the elusive ghost particle. To be clear, consciousness is different from awareness. In the Netherlands, we have this quote of Johan Cruyff, the football player, saying, you only see it when you realize your interpretation of it. Very interesting. Ra, just to filter consciousness and be a filter of consciousness, then we have we become like the stars themselves. This is what outer authority is. Outer authority is starlight. It's beautiful. And that those neutrinos are built on data streams and that they are sourced to all the stars. Stars are the source of consciousness. Urania's mirror, Scorpio from 1825. Most people think about neutrinos coming in, but never think about them going out. Those trillions of neutrinos that are going through every square centimeter of your vehicle all the time, day and night, 24 hours a day to pass through, and they take a little bit of you with them. This is a quote. This is continuing the quote from Ra. And they take them out into space at nearly the speed of light in every possible direction. With 70% stardust created by nuclear reactions in the sun, Life on Earth has this basically deep coexistence with the solar destiny of our solar system. And everything else is alignment in the greater movement, because that's what everything else is about. In terms of the neutrino stream, as it impacts each and every one of us. What about Antares? The name is derived from anti Aries, which means the rival of Mars because of being such a bright red giant. In another way, it suits also in the seven-centered astrological realm. See the image here. So, let's see. Yeah, we have this image here where we have Aries, the first house, and then Scorpio is kind of across from it. It's not opposite, because that would be Libra, Let's see, diagonal, but it is a cross. Interesting. In that sense, this very redness was associated with war, military, aggressiveness, etc. Ra personally didn't consider the Martian attributes to be the most important. To remember that one of his speculations in all of this are the planetary affiliations as keys to understanding the way in which the star nuances its impact in the program. But first, to give you a sense of dimension here, 
This is the orbit of Mars around the sun, and Antares is even larger. So the orbit of Mars, 227 million kilometers radius. Another phenomenon as an indicator of unique relationship is that every year around the 2nd of December, our sun and Antares have this unique alignment where Antares just becomes visible beyond the glow of the sun. And here is December 2nd, uh, 2005. This image here looks like the sun in the middle with Antares beyond the glow. Interesting. Not wanting to make, this is raw now, not wanting to make Earth life too complicated for you, but the light that we receive from those stars, that light originates from different time frames. Related to the neutrino stream, we really receive a time-associated information soup, which source is rooted in different, vast time frames, giving this view that the crystals of consciousness are acting as a synthesizing agent for all of this diverse information. So what comes to us from our Antares to recognize is not the present. His light is ancient for us. It's like Sandulik, 1987a, the event, the supernova happened a long, long, long time ago. But when we saw it, that's another thing. But that light had to travel to reach us. So I want you to think about the information pool and the impact in that information pool. This is still raw. Thinking of that perfect alignment of Aldebaran and Antares 70,000 years ago, relative to the perspective of Earth, it was also relative to different times of originating light in their movements. And then to think that the very order of the cosmos must lead to a creator, it's completely silly. We have to do with a vast, vast, vast ocean of deeply, deeply, deeply complex layers and layers and layers of intertwined data. No single perspective or a single moment, unless you want to go right back to the Big Bang. Yeah, it's interesting that it's these things are coming in at different time frames. I had an interesting conversation earlier today uh, with a friend Henry, and he mentioned you know, what we call reality, um, we're really combining visual with auditory information. But the visual information is coming in at the speed of light. The auditory information is coming in the speed of sound, you know, 600 miles an hour, rather than 186,000 miles per hour. And this vastly different speed, the speed of light versus the speed of sound, we're taking in that information and we're synthesizing it and putting it together and creating something that we experience as this moment, as this instant. But this moment is combining vastly different data streams. No single perspective or a single moment, unless you wanna go right back to the Big Bang. Although we can't eliminate all the background info coming with Antares. Antares is a dominant visual attractive force throughout our conscious history, going back to the dropping of the larynx. That because we've always been looking at it, we align ourselves to its neutrino stream. And there's something in that. There is an ingredient that holds us together in the Maya construct. Astrology and the discovery of the transpersonal planets. When the transpersonal planets were not yet discovered, Saturn was associated with Aquarius, Jupiter with Pisces, and Mars with Scorpio. And Persephone is still waiting to be discovered. And here we have the life cycle of a star. Stellar nebula turns to either average star or massive star, then red giant or red supergiant, planetary nebula or supernova, and then the planetary nebula turns into a white dwarf, the supernova turns into a neutron star or a black hole.
And then after 20,000 years, there's this merging together of concepts, the relation between when the rain comes, when the fishing season starts, etc., and the appearance of certain objects somewhere in the sky, planets or stars. Ra. I don't think that astronomy was developed to explore the sky as much as it was developed to point to what was being given a name. For example, the shamans together on a certain evening when Antares was going to be occulted by the moon, which is a wonderful event. And to be able to stand there and say, here, this is where it's going to happen. So that they can actually see Antares. They can actually see the, the occultation and they can understand what they were looking for. It was a way of being able to point to something that somebody somehow in some tradition had carried as a name for that particular object. It's just interesting to see. It's just this pointing. It was the Romans during the reign of Julius Caesar who broke off the scorpion's claws and turned them into the symbol of justice, which we know as the constellation of Libra, the scales. Here we have an image of a 16th century globe. The sky gods, these four cardinal stars, every six hours, one after another, they rise on and on. Here are the sky gods coming in. This is the moment that the great framework of the Maya becomes established. And if the moment comes to name the sky, this is getting into really, really mystical territory. Every time you mention that name, and somebody else knows what you mean and also shares that name. Fundamentally, what you're doing is establishing some kind of reason for why the sky is there. And in going back to these four royal stars, they were actually agents of defining the whole tradition of trying to integrate the microcosm with something macrocosmic. Antares in gate nine. Antares is in the quarter of Prometheus in the ninth gate. Well, that ninth gate with its opposite gate, 16, Aldebaran, formed that other arm of the cross of planning. Next to gate 16 with its skills and gifts, the ninth gate is the bedrock of scientific investigation. Here's the grunt work, the shoulder on the wheel, a very powerful force to master detail and see how incredible the quantum of that is. You know, it's interesting because um, we're seeing the end of the cross of planning and we're moving into the cross of the sleeping phoenix as the externalization theme of the global cycle. And it's so interesting to see, um, just as we're moving from penetration to the Maya as the internalization theme, to see these, these gates break down. And what that means, by the way, when you hear about the global cycles, there's an internalization theme and an externalization theme. And so there's really eight gates. There's four gates that are kind of internalization, how we take things in. Then there's the four gates that are going to be more obvious, obvious in how the, it, it, it's changing and how the world is changing. And those are the externalization gates. Those are the, uh, the gates for the vessel of love. The internalization gates are for the keys of the cross of the Sphinx. And together, these eight gates, uh, these eight keys are the eight gates of the G center. Right. So you have one, two, seven, and 13. Those are the keys for internalization. And then you have um, 10, 15, 46, 25. Those are the gates for externalization of the global cycle. And the keys change, right? Um, I guess, yeah, the, the, those are the lock gates. Excuse me if I misspoke. Those are the locks. Uh, because the keys change in each era, the locks stay the same. So those eight gates in the G center always stay the same, making this kind of perennial, um, you know, the eight locks, internalization and externalization themes. But the keys change due to the procession of the equinoxes, the sidereal zodiac moving against the tropical zodiac, which is why it's incorrect when people say, why doesn't human design use the sidereal zodiac? It does. It absolutely does. Our analysis of global cycles is the analysis of the sidereal against the tropical zodiac and that movement 
that movement of one moving across the other. Uh, kind of like how in Chinese philosophy, in ancient Chinese philosophy, they had the heavenly order and the earth, the earthly order, which were the sort of fixed versus the changeable. And so we have uh, the fixed order of the gates of the G center, which occur at the same time each year, the, uh, the solstices and the equinoxes and the midpoints. And then we have the movable order moving against it which is the sidereal zodiac that moves very slowly. It takes almost 25,000 years to make one complete cycle. And it's just interesting because when we look at the externalization themes, I mean, they're all interesting to look at, but um, I noticed uh, there's a kind of Instagram story that's been going around, not in human design, but it's just very relevant. And it's against the move towards minimalism. And it shows all of these examples of you know an old ornate doorbell, a Baroque doorbell, and so on, and then a modern minimal doorbell, and kind of an older park bench and a more modern contemporary park bench, and older windows and more modern windows, older buildings and more modern buildings, and it's it's really saying, you know, minimalism is fine and well, except that it's it's led to a complete loss of detail. That it's not just minimalism because you could have detailed minimalism, but that we've moved into an era of losing the detail and everything becoming sort of um, undetailed and just, you know, it's like a big button instead of an ornate interface. And so I just really thought that that was so relevant to see how as we've approached the end of the cross of planning, people ask me, you know, what's it gonna be like after 2027? Well, it's this the themes that you already see continuing the loss of detail we're losing nine and 16. nine that the taming power of the small is very detailed and of course 16 has to do with detail as well but nine especially to master detail and to think about that the cross of planning is something that integrates the traditional cardinal points this is again raw talking and Ross says, for him, it's an elegant way of saying that the illusion that was constructed with the seven-centered being is finally being shattered and coming to an end. However, it's really something to keep in mind. The presence of these great objects, their neutrino stream, the tradition of them being watched so carefully, the fact that they are on the ecliptic and that they have a relationship to planetary objects. Here's a quote from Ra. Antares has two main occultations. It occults Venus, which means going in front of it, which is very interesting, but rare. The next time is going to be somewhere in 2400. It also occults the moon. That's not so rare. The last time was in 2004. So the relationships with both the moon and Venus would be very interesting in those time frames when that takes place. Ra's talking about wars, and he is, again is based on wrong years. However, in his progress with that, he concludes that gate 9 and 16 aren't based on politics. That's the tribal 4037, though a tough dilemma for scientists being confronted within this cycle. Yeah, I would just point out that 4037 also have something to do with science in that uh, they define the ego, and the ego has to do with proof and proving it. And it was during this ego-defined global cycle that humans began demanding a lot more proof. The association with Mars, the fourth line. Here, Ra should have loved to know the correct year, because this marked, of course, the beginning of World War I. Interesting. Oh, I see. This is um, 1914. Gate 9, line 4, dedication, Mars and detriment. Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. However, by all kind of treaties, many other countries became involved. So it could express this stress between reason, 916, and the tribe, 4037. But again, politics is not specifically gate nine related. I also wouldn't say that the ego is unreasonable. I think that there is something like reason in the ego. Uh, not an awareness center, of course, but um, 
it is uh, a center that has to do with what's reasonable or not in the same sense that you might say what's fair or not. Um, giving somebody a fair chance to prove their side of it. That's core to reason. It's, it's reasonable to be charitable, not too charitable, but charitable in your philosophical discussion and to reasonably, you know, give somebody enough um, enough benefit of the doubt and so on, which is a charitable kind of hospitable stance in philosophical debate. And that does have to do with reason. And another interesting guess should be to trace how long it takes for Antares to go from base one of a tone to the base one of the next tone and to see whether it impacts orientation. Now, that would be very interesting. I would love to do that kind of research of looking at the fixed stars, which we know take, you know, 68 to 70 years to go through a single line, but they might take only 11 or 12 years to go through a color and only one or two years to go through a tone. So that's a much more interesting, interesting way to, uh, to kind of break it down or two or three years. So, okay. Um, Antares movement in time. 1712, it entered into line one of gate nine, a balanced and responsible approach to problem solving. The ability to avoid frustration through the creation of new forms. And so again here, it's when it has planetary exaltations and detriments that those planets People who have those planets in these gates would be particularly exemplary of the influence of Antares, whereas if they have a different activation there. So somebody born after 2049 who has the moon in gate nine, line six, would really express Antares or moon or Uranus, it looks like. I think that's a symbol of Uranus, kind of an interesting one or somebody born after 82, like I was born in 1983. I don't have gate nine, line five. I have gate nine, line one. Um, so, but if I, if I were to have line five, having Jupiter or Earth there. So yeah, very interesting to see how Antares kind of moves through gate nine. The 916 frequency. Ah, yeah, it's showing. There's a chart showing them. Of course, interesting is being an arm at the cross of planning. However, to think of what it brought us, that we as a direct result of this global frequency are able to see these forces out here. It's part of what makes our time so dense as a Maya. This global cycle where global planning is pursued and the nine-centered being emerged. As nine-centered beings, we have never been through a change of cycle. And this background frequency is going to shift. It means that the illusion and the cycle are going to be out of sync with each other. Slowly, we may realize what that means. When the cycle changes, it's going to be radical. Everything that we have trusted as stable in the illusion is going to melt and everything, something else is going to take its place. But from a mechanical point of view, it must be fascinating to track these two wheels of the ruling stars, Jupiter inclusive, and the one of the four cardinal stars in their relationship to each other to watch the definitions emerge through history and see things relative to the time frame of the history that is there. And the underlying mechanics of the ruling stars and what was the illusion being established by the royal stars played out. Putting those two together, you get the way the phenomenon that phenomenon operates on Earth. To learn to know those things relative to the past and information to possibly be applied on future cycles. Till 1615, the cycle before 1615 was under the cross of consciousness. For Europe, a period of famine, the plague, war, and poverty, but also a counterpoint known as the Renaissance, Middle Eastern knowledge that was imported through Italy, 
often through Venice, and eventually found its way into a very select group of intellectual pursuers with a particular interest for stars that were associated with magic. They were considered to be essential to any kind of existence of the possibility of magic in the world. We have stars associated with some of the signs here, or I guess these are the sacred symbols of the stars. Very interesting. Magic and Maya have the same root, yeah, Ma. In so many ways, Antares, Aldebaran, Regulus, and Fomalhaut are the projectors of the multidimensional Maya show as mechanisms in this holistic totality we are part of, living in this neutrino ocean. Jan writes, he cannot understand the stars and ingredients in the whole field that is there, but perhaps somehow that nuanced value can be distilled through the way in which it's accenting the program at any given time. Or is this still a quote from Ra? I, I guess. Hmm. I guess this is Jan. Sometimes he writes like Ra. The scorpion is something that is a very powerful symbol, and in many ways it is a symbol of the possibility of resurrection in the magical sense of the word. The new being, the new man, the new woman, the new possibility. The Bohemian stars and their use for occult purpose. In the context of Scorpio, magic, and stars, hereby a short overview of the so-called Bohemian stars. The Bohemian stars are 15 stars which by the ancients were considered as a source or a root of astrological power that was magnified whenever one or more of the visible planets were within six degrees. All those stars are easily visible by the naked eye, and they are all to be found in the northern hemisphere. Yeah, these, these are the Bohemian stars here, although there's a typo, for instance, Angol, I think it should be Algol. Deneb el Gedi, Vega, Antares, Alfeca, Ralpeca, Arcturus, Spica, Hiena, Alcade. This one doesn't have a name on it, interestingly. Regulus, Procyon, or Procyon, Sirius, Aldebaran, Capella, the Pleiades. So let's pick this back up. Uh, this has been part nine of our fun reading group. Thank you so much, Jan van den Berg, for this incredible text. And let's pick this up soon with part 10, where we will look at the Bohemian stars. Thanks for watching.